أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. So this is our third uh, Black Muslim Lecture Series. Um, BMLS is an initiative that brings to New York City Black Muslim scholars and artists um, to really highlight and showcase the diversity of the Black Muslim experience. And it's an invitation for all of us, regardless of our background, in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of ethnicity, to really benefit from the wealth uh, and depth of the experience. Black Muslim diaspora. I have the unique task of introducing Brother Amir Suleiman, who, let me just start. <laughs> All right. For those of you who do not know him, you are in for a treat. Amir Suleiman is a Grammy nominated poet, recording artist, Harvard Fellow and producer, screenwriter for film and television. He has performed his work across the US and around the world uh, in places like England, Belgium, Senegal, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, Australia, Iran, and the Netherlands, and continues to tour worldwide. The album 846, Amir created with Dave Chappelle, has earned them a Grammy nomination and praise from publications like Variety and USA Today. The shows he has written and produced for Marvel, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and HBO have garnered Emmy, Golden Globe, and Peabody nominations. Uh, his poetry collection, Love, Gnosis, and other suicide attempts met with critical acclaim. In addition to his latest album, The Opening, the third in a unique trilogy project, Amir was first introduced to a national audience in 2005 when he was featured for two seasons on Russell Simon's groundbreaking series, Death Poetry Jam. Join me in welcoming Mr. Rinsuleman to the stage, please. How are you on this fine evening? Good. I'm very happy to be here with you. I think this is my second time speaking at NYU. Um, when I was here, so I was trying to remember how many years ago it was. Was anyone here the last time I was here? Four years ago. Wow, amazing. So I was here four years ago. It was a wonderful occasion. <clears throat> then um, somebody ate a rat or a bat or something, and then <clears throat> four years later, here I am. But at least we kept our promise, and uh, I ended up returning here to you, so I'm grateful and happy for that. And now all of us uh, are here to tell the story, to tell the tale. Um, I'm a poet, as you guys know, and I want to recite some poetry. Uh, however, I really would like this not to be a presentation, but more of a conversation. It would be my preference. So I just want you to know, it's not like there's some poetry and then some talking and then like a question and answer segment or something like that. I like for us just to talk. So at any point you have a question, I want you to feel free to ask the question. And you know, if you don't have a question, you don't have to make up a question. But if you have it, I want you to feel free. And so I would like to do that together with you. We can do the way where, now I say, 
a poem and you're quiet and then I stop and then you clap and then you're quiet and then you're quiet and then, you're quiet and then I stop and then you clap and then we could do that, I've done that. I'm a professional. However, there's an alternative that I'm interested in, but it can only work if we're in consensus, if we have uh, agreement on it. So uh, are you agreed to have a conversation? Yes. Okay. That's good. You know, she, uh, she asked, what does it feel like when a poem comes out? And I said, it's like I'm writing my insides out. And I've got to get it out before my pen dries out, before my ego finds out, can't let my ego find out. Because when I'm writing my insides out, my every fear, my every flaw flies out. In my ego, where those fears and flaws hide out, so whatever I do, can't let my ego find out. If I couldn't write my insides out, I don't know, I'd probably blow my bloody mind out. Instead, I write and recite to blow me a third eye out. She said, oh, that's what danger, that man walking's all about? I said, yeah. She said, well, I'm glad you took the divine route. And I said, yes, I took the divine route, but it's only a matter of time before the world finds out this is both heaven and hell coming out of my mouth. And she asked, where is the truth hidden? I laughed, not because she asked, but because as I'm living, I'm learning that the truth is hidden everywhere, literally everywhere. There is no place you can scour, search, or visit, except the truth is hidden. The truth is hidden, even the question, where is the truth hidden? It can't be hidden. It is the truth of living. Those that are seeking to hide the truth try to convince me you that they hid it, but they didn't. And it's not that the truth isn't being spoken, perhaps we are not ready to listen. Certainly we are not ready to listen. And you may be at home in my poem, and if not, you may just visit. And if you can't visit, maybe you shouldn't listen. My poetry is not for everyone. It's no navy blue Yankee fitted. In fact, it's highly acidic, enough to burn through the mind of a critic. Why be a cynic? When we're moving beyond the speed of light, there is no difference between time and distance. Such I'm both here and there in the same instant. For instance, I'm both man and infant, both devil and angel. I am both the witness and the witness, both monk and misfit. I am the medicine in this sick. And if you would like to know what the truth is, I wrote the answer, the axis of the seven senses, and I told sis, hold this. Close to your heart until your soul sits still in the summer solstice. She said, I can't keep my soul still. It's hard to hold my focus. She said, I've noticed that I can't seem to focus on any real goals. I can only focus on what's closest. She said, how do you know what your goal is? I said, I don't. How does one save the souls of the soulless? An eviction notice stapled to the heart of the heedless. Souls left homeless. No place to reside in, so they hide out and slide in the bodies of two-eyed men. So my lyricism is an exercise in exorcism, but the exoteric call it esotericism. I learned to hand from Rumi. The Sunni call me Shia, the Shia call me Sufi. The feds say I have WMDs for what I do with the loose leaf, because what I do with the loose leaf make devils lose sleep. And I don't care who's on whose dean. I follow the one who ascended the seven heavens and lands on two feet. And it may be too deep, but it is only by his light that you can see through me. But if by his light we have sight, then what is the meaning of day and what is the meaning of night? And I would like not to say that I'm living at night, but I'm living very late awesome. In the insana life Rough translation, I'm a loser. I aim to block his life, yet claim to follow his sunnah. The truth is, the truth is I wish I could sing so I could mask the bitter truth with sweet melody. Unfortunately for both you and me, I only know how to speak straight with direct diction that doesn't allow for mistakes. She said, you beat, speak so whole while the beat breaks, it's so ill, it's so real. I said, it's so real, but I'm so fake. She said, but you sound so sure. I said, that's the point, I'm not sure. I'm barely afloat in the sea without shore. And if you've seen what I saw, then you will certainly know that certainty without flaw is often delusion and no certainty at all. And when it is certainly certainty, and it's like a drunken monk, a man so on his square looking at any moment, he will fall, but he never falls. At that moment, she paused and began to recite Vagabond. I was surprised she nearly memorized my whole poem, she said. If I'm a traveler in this world, then where do I find home? I say, just keep your nose to the grindstone. 
Tell your mind to never mind the unknown. This is why I rhyme like the Spirit of God is in my poem, because in the beginning there was the Word, and before that there was the unheard, the unseen. There is nothing past but the present. There is nothing past the past but the present. Just as the moon begins with the crescent, it seems that way, but in that there is the lesson. The whole moon's always present. The whole moon's always present. The whole moon's always present. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? <laughs> I want to keep my keep my word. You guys okay? I just miss something. Yes, in the in the back. Uh, I have a question on how you prevent the window from getting Uh-huh. Uh, maybe everybody can hear. She said um, she had a question asking, how do I prevent my ego from getting in the way? Yeah? Of the writing. Of the writing. Yeah. Getting of the writing. Uh, I don't know if I successfully do, but this is the earnest uh, attempt that what I find not only in the writing, but also in the presentation of it. So even if I quote unquote am successful and you know, I don't allow my ego to be a part of it and I write it successfully, uh, but then I have to present it like I am now. So there's a lot of the presentation of the poem that lends itself to the ego. For example, I'm on stage, I have a microphone, no one else has a microphone. There's a light shining on me to say I'm important. <laughs> Listen to what he's saying in this context, you know? Um, but it's always to uh, remember where the poem is coming from, where it's coming from, and, uh, and uh, it's better that way, meaning the actual quality of the poem is better if I do it that way. So in some ways even my ego can be pacified by saying like, listen, like I'm talking to my ego, like listen, you want to make the best poem, you want to make the worst poem, okay? You want to make a mediocre poem, you want to make a great poem. Let's make a great poem. Because my nephew likes to write great poems because I love to be a great poet. So. The best way for us to do that is we have to get out of, you have to like move to the side so I can make the best poem. But um, like I said in the, in, the, in the verse, you know, my every, when, when I'm hiding my insides out, my every fear, my every flaw flies out. So sometimes it gets in the way because I'm composing something that's almost maybe even a little scary, even for me. You know, I'm writing something about myself and I arrive somewhere in my writing and I even surprise myself. And it's like I'm trying to smuggle sentiments out of myself. So these things are hidden in myself, but then the, like the border patrol is my nafs. Like, you're gonna tell everybody that? Like, you're gonna say that out loud in front of everyone? And so it'll come and say, you know, what are your papers? Oh, you wanna say, uh, oh no, you can't say that. You, gotta, you have to go back. And so that prevents the poetry from flowing. And so uh, circumventing that, building a tunnel or getting around it or over it or something is much of the ongoing negotiation with myself in order to do what I'm doing here now with you. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, it, it, different poems are different. So some poems I write, uh, I'll never share. Not, not even because they're secret, just because they're trash. So I wrote the poem, but I was like, this is bad poetry. Sometimes, or sometimes something will be, you know, that it, it's not designed for sharing. Um, other things, it's, it's, it's only designed, like I have to share it immediately. Or it's like, I know I want to share this, but it's not quite ready yet, and I'm gonna work on it more. So each, poem, there's a negotiation and seeing like what is this poem for is really what it is. It's like what is the function of this poem? Is this just part of my process? Um, is this something that I, I need people to know about me? Or is this something I need to put in the world that will service the world in some valuable way? Um, you know, but each, each poem has a 
there is no set standard but for the way that I engage it. Yes. yes. How do you find the rhythm of the problem? When, and when does, at what point in the process does that really come to fruition? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, when I'm writing poetry, very, very, very rarely, probably about more than 99% of the time, I don't know what the poem's about when I start writing. So I don't start with a subject and start writing. Usually I just start with language, like sounds of words. And this word sounds good with that word, and this sound sounds good with that sound. So there's this, a kind of a musicality that, that begins the poems most of the time. Or it may be a, a line that has meaning, <clears throat> Uh, but it's just it's just a, a one line, you know, and um, so I've never so very rarely do I have a subject, but I absolutely never have a rhyme scheme in mind first. So I never say okay, I want to go thing to go ba 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 ba, and then I, I write it then. Although that's a vibe in our uh, poets and MCs and that our songwriters that obviously do that, uh, but that's just never been the way that I've uh, approached it. And so um, the poem is kind of unveiling itself to me as I'm writing it. And somewhere like maybe midway through the poem, I'm like, oh, this is what this poem's about. Um, sometimes the poems are conversations, like this poem, where I'm having an earnest conversation. It's not like I know the conversation's gonna end and I'm, having this, I'm writing this conversation to an end. I'm earnestly having a conversation and asking questions and answering questions and so on and so forth in verse. And I'm, um, like you, kind of listening and uh, allowing it to meander and see, you know, where it goes. Yeah. I'll take this one and I'm going to recite something else. But if, if anyone else has questions, I'm not shutting you down. We'll, we'll uh, circle back to you. So if you start, mm -hmm. if you start your poems with a sound and not a message, how do you protect yourself from writing a poem with a message Mm -hmm. So because I don't have a, because you can, you can kind of, oh, he was, I, I, I realized I should repeat the questions. The question, I, the previous question I answered, he was asking the rhythm of the poetry, when do I make a decision about how the poetry flows? Yes. And then uh, he's asking if I don't have an idea of what the subject matter is, how do I protect myself from just people pleasing and just writing what sounds good, essentially. But there's, you can people please with subject matter or with sound. So I can say, oh, okay, people are really talking about this or you know, this would be interesting or this would be a hot topic um, and write about that subject. I'm just not interested in neither in form nor substance nor topic. That's never just been a, a motivation for me. Uh, and um, so I'm not uh, not thinking about topics for any reason. It's just not the way that the poetry comes. Um, so, for example, uh, my heart won't think, but my mind refuses to feel. So it leaves me senseless, sleepless, restless, wandering, wondering. I only come to my senses between sentences, and a sentence ends without a period point or without a point, period. My points seem hollow, like hollow points. Fried at point blank range, that would crack my brain like my brain on crack. So for example, when I started writing that poem, I just thought, <laughs> so, so, uh, so when I started writing that poem, I didn't know what the poem was about, right? I just, these sounds, the, the, the ideas and the sounds, so my heart won't think but my mind refuses to feel. I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. And this was a, a state of, that I was in where I was like uh, relying on the mind or the heart and how to, uh, how to be sound in judgment between these two. This is an age old question, but my heart won't think, but my mind refuses to feel. And so that was like an interesting, but I don't know if that what the poem quote unquote is about or is that just a line or whatever. Um, my heart won't think, but my mind refuses to feel. So it leaves me sleepless. Restless, wandering, wondering. So it's just those words sounded. I like the way the words sound. Sleepless, restless, wandering, wondering. I only come to my senses between sentences, and a sentence ends without a period point or without a point period. My points seem hollow. I'm gonna recite the rest of the poem now. My points seem hollow, like how? 
and imagine, this is where the poem goes. I don't know at the beginning of the poem where this poem's gonna go, right? My points seem hollow like hollow points, fired at point blank range. I would crack my brain like my brain on crack. I'm somewhere in between sane and black, stressed and brown. I'm a milky mulatto, passing in the city of the living, passing and pretending as if I haven't died already, and I say I'm all ready to do it again because I'm a man of my word and a man of my worth and a man of the earth. I come from her and I will return to the dirt, commune with the worms, just can't let it take a turn for the worse by passing and pretending until I really believe that I'm living and haven't died already. Because I'm a man of my word and a man of my worth and a man of the earth and she will find me and pull me to her bosom until I can neither breathe nor speak, see nor blink, dream nor think. I think I'm dreaming of a vanilla sky and a chocolate earth and a Carmel girl that sings when she speaks with perfume in her walk, her body transparent by how sincerely we talk, will take long walks and gardens with rivers flowing beneath. What was old and grieved is now new and sweet, like sweet sweat was swept off of our feet, like souls solace in a sanctuary of God. In the precious presence of unspeakable beauty, the precious presence is present, past and future. It is past time, past space, time passed away, never to come again. That kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so on earth. I am this in heaven, so on earth. I fear not my end, I fear not of men, so on earth. I fight demon and desperate, the avaricious and the treacherous with love in my mercy and fire in my justice, with love for the courageous and hatred for cowardice because why be a coward? How else do men ascend to their Lord except upon the wings of the angel of death? So I'm a man of my word, and a man of my worth, and a man of the earth. And may she find me, and pull me to her bosom, until I can neither breathe nor speak, see nor blink, dream nor think. I think I'm dreaming of a vanilla sky, and a chocolate earth. In a Carmel girl that sings when she speaks with perfume in her walk, her body transparent by how sincerely we talk, will take long walks and gardens with rivers flowing beneath. What, what, what was old and grieved is now new and sweet, like sweet sweat was swept off of our feet, like soul solaced in the sanctuary of God. <laughs> so this is. This is, this poem, it's not like a, so this poem, right? So to your question, I'm, I'm just these words, right? And seeing where they take me and each word is leading me to another word and phrase and an image and until I get to the part, uh, I come from her and I'll return to the dirt, commune with the worms and say, no, she'll pull me to her bosom. Until I can either breathe nor speak, see nor blink, dream nor think, I think I'm dreaming. So there, um, uh, it's a poem about a, a love affair, be, uh, a love affair between two women. Not like that, we're not having a polygamy conversation, just so you know. <laughs> but, but one is representative of the earth, and one is representative of the, of the next life, right? So, I have an affinity for the earth. Like I, I come from her. I come from the dirt. I'm, I'm made of clay. So there's an, a, a, a maternal um, relationship that I have with this earth. Uh, she will find me and pull me to her bosom until I can neither breathe nor speak. This is me going into my grave. When I, when I finally be reunited with my beloved mother, the earth. Yeah. Uh, but as I'm descending into the earth, then the poem switches. So, uh, see nor blink, dream nor think. I think I'm dreaming of a vanilla sky and a chocolate earth. Then I'm dreaming of a vanilla sky and a chocolate earth and a caramel girl that sings when she speaks and perfume as a walk, her body transparent by how sincerely we talk or we'll take long walks in the gardens with rivers flowing beneath. And obviously we know this as a, a reference to the description of Jenna in the Quran. Uh, what was old and grieved is now new and sweet, like sweet sweat was swept off of our feet, like soul solace in the sanctuary of God. So that is like the middle of the poem. And that's the part where I'm like, oh, this is what this poem's about. But I didn't know it until then. And then I write from that, then I let what the poem's about inform how the rest of the poem flows and so on and so forth. 
But it started with this, my heart won't think when my mind refuses to feel, and, and then it ended up being that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Do you go I, back and change what you wrote when you find out what it's about? Yeah, sometimes. So sometimes at uh, the end, I'll even take that. I was like, actually, we should start here. And I'll move it, and I'll take chunks, and definitely I'll move things around once I get the understanding of this is where I'm going to end, this is where I'm going to land, this is the kind of thesis, the central idea, and then I'll arrange it to make that most effective, as best as I can. Um, what are your tips for a writer that wants to get over writer's block, and like, mm. how to keep the words that continue to flow? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, she asks uh, tips about uh, writers who suffer from writer's block. I, I, uh, at different points in my writing life, I was gonna say writing career, but even before it was a career, it was, um, yeah, I'm really severely challenged by that. But the thing that I found that rang most true, most consistently, was the getting the ego out of the way. That's really, um, like, I'm, I'm, I feel, it's a strange, it's, it's a strange fear to have, but I'm afraid of writing poorly, so I just don't write. But it's silly because I'm just in the room by myself. Like no one's gonna laugh at me. I'm just in there by myself. I'm so I, I my ego doesn't even want to be embarrassed in front of itself writing something that's so bad. Um, when I was younger, it was always more of a panic. I, I, I mean, perpetually, year after year after year after year, I would go through this, and I'd be like, like the 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 writer's block would come. You know, the kind of words would dry up. And I'd be like, Ah, it's over. Like, man, I had a good run. I wrote a lot of really great poems, and well, that's over. And uh, I really, I always felt like the absolute end. Like I was never gonna write another poem again. It felt that empty and barren and definitive. And then you know, it would pass, and then when it would come again, I would feel the same way. But as I grew more and it just became more mature as a writer, I saw it kind of as seasons, you know? It's like the tree's not, you know, dying. Not really, you know? Uh, because the leaves fell off of it, it's, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna come back. And so that was another thing because the panic would extend the writer's block. And so be relaxed in it, but write anyway. Eat, write poorly, you know? Do, write um, bad poetry. Um, one of the things that helped me in that is, I saw it like uh, I have a golden poem waiting for me. Like my poems are already written, I have a golden poem waiting for me. And like I can see it, I see it almost like, um, you know how you um, have cards, like a domino effect, like card, like they're in my mind, they're lined up like this, these poems. And down the line is like a golden poem, and then there's another golden poem, and then down further there's another golden poem. But I just have to write these trash poems to get to that golden poem. Like I can't leapfrog to the golden poem. So then each bad poem I would write, I would feel a little happy, like a little relieved. Like, man, ooh, another poem that sucks. Okay, that means I'm one more <laughs> poem closer to the golden poem, you know? And so and that's what it is. You just have to keep going and keep going. And, um, and some of it is just pure uh, discipline and getting the ego out of the way because it's so afraid to perform poorly, you know? Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, poetry is one of like my favorite things in the world, um, especially because of how I found it. So I want to know how did you find it? Uh, she asked me how I found poetry. Uh, I don't, to, earnestly, I don't remember because I was so young. So I started writing poetries and stories and things like that when I was, even before I remember. So my mother tells me about when I was a very little kid and I thought it was something that everyone did. So I would go out and play with my friends and then come home and write poems. I thought everybody was going home and write their poems <laughs> too. But then it turned out everybody wasn't writing poems. But I never, my mother was also a, a writer, not professionally, but it's something that she loved. And so I never felt um, weird about that. I, I thank God for that, I never, and I thank my mother for that. I never felt like, oh, I do something that other kids don't do and I don't want to do it. I, I felt special. So I was like, oh, well, I do this thing that other people don't do. And so, I just kept to it. And really, my biggest inspiration was um, hip hop. So, you know, hip hop music 
it's so lyric driven, you know, it's such an important part of the experience and there's so much detail and attention and curating the language at such a high level and such a multi-layered level. And so I was fascinated. I was just like, um, it was like magic. Um, hearing, you know, hearing how words can make me feel. So I'd be listening to a record, I would listen to something and Nas would be like, you know, through the lights, camera, action, glamour, glitters, and gold, I can fold the scroll, plant seeds, and stampede the globe. When I'm deceased, but then the beast arise like yeast, the carve a peace, leaving savages to roam in the streets, live on the run, police paying me to give them my gun. It was just like these words, it's like, why are these words? Like I'm seeing things and feeling things, and, uh, and I was like, I wanna do that. So I was already writing, but what really drove my writing, pushed my writing, was listening to them create these worlds and these images um, and you know me saying like, I, I wanna do that, I wanna be able to write like that. And so before I knew about what we would call formal poetry or before I heard about it in school or before I picked up a book of poetry, that was my first real introduction to, uh, to poetry. And that led me to what we would traditionally call you know, American poetry or Sufi poetry or other things like that, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I have two questions. Wait, I have a lot of questions, but I have two questions for you now. Uh, right. What's your favorite thing you ever read, and what's your favorite thing you ever wrote? Um, he asked, what was the favorite thing I ever read, and the favorite thing I ever wrote? All right, to the one that I ever read, I know it's going to sound like I'm cheating, but I'm very, very serious. al Fatiha is like the, and I don't mean that just because I'm going to put some function, because it's like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> what else is he going to say, Harry Potter? No, for real. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, uh, it's so masterful in the Quran, of course, in general, but even as a, as a poet, and, and, and as a poet, I'm not even an, an Arab poet, so I can, okay, all right, so here's a few reasons on why I'll find that my answer. <clears throat> One is I'm amazed by, and I don't know Arabic well enough to be amazed, really, I'm just amazed at other people's amazement. <laughs> so these people, are master poets from a long line of master poets, these Bedouin Arabs, masters of the Arabic language at amazing levels. What made them hear this and say this, a human being could not have written this? Now, I don't have enough sophistication in Arabic to really, I, I can like uh, read people's um, analysis of this, but I, I don't have enough knowledge for my, for me to have that experience of like, I'm hearing something that a human being could never write. I don't even know what that means. Like, what does that mean where you know instantly, just hearing it one time, no human being could have written that. And I don't mean just the prophecies in it. I'm not talking about the, um, uh, you know, embryology or the other miracles in the Quran. Just the, the actual language itself and how it's composed. They were certain that it couldn't have been a human being, and for some of them that was enough for them to be like, this is the truth. So that's amazing to me. I've never, we don't have a reference for that with any other, um, I've never heard anyone talk about any other piece of literature where there were people who were masters of that language that were convinced that no human being, no created person could have written this Shakespeare or could have written this whatever. So that's amazing. But then also, um, and I thought to you, we have just the, the, the beauty of the rhyme and the meter uh, of it. And then how Allah is revealing himself in the order, in the way that Allah is introducing himself. So when, uh, so I write for film and television as well, and there's a lot of importance placed on how a character is introduced. What is the first thing that the character says? What's the first thing that the character does? Uh, how does the character first interact with other characters? So the way Allah introduces himself is so um, amazing even in that sense, you know? Introduces himself as Allah and then he mentions praise, alhamdulillah, and, and 
I saw I saw um, on, on Instagram this preacher. He was a uh, Christian preacher. He was talking about his Uber driver getting out of his car to make some laugh. <laughs> you guys seen this thing, right? If anyone who hasn't seen it, so it's this preacher, this black American preacher. And he's uh, he's you know he's riled up. He's giving his you know his his sermon, and uh, he's talking about praise. Oh, no, he's talking about prayer. So his Uber driver gets out of the car, rolls out his rug, and prays the door prayer, whatever, right? And so he's telling his congregation about this. He says, this man gets out of his car. He gets his rug. He got it out. He's describing the situation. He said, and I'm, I'm late. I'm upset. And then, and then his, his sense of pride, it's a good type of pride that he has. His sense of pride was like, look how this man worships God and prays God. He's like, I'm not going to be out worshiped by a Muslim, right? <laughs> So he's encouraging his congregation by way of seeing this man's dedication to praise. And uh, which, uh, which was, I mean, for wonderful in so, in so many ways and hilarious. And I was reflecting on when it comes to praise and worship, and this isn't just a kind of religious, uh, what do you say, like a chauvinism or religious uh, pride. It's just objectively true. There's no community that praises God the way the Muslims praise God. No one can come even close. There's no people as a mass group, as a, as, a, as a general rule, for the common practitioners of the religion to stop and praise God with their tongue and their body, even twice a day or three times a day. But for the general masses to do that, five times a day, and Surah to Fatiha to do it 17 times a day. No one says the Lord's Prayer 17 times a day. There's no Christian that says the Lord's Prayer. There are elite monks among the Christians or among the Buddhists or among the other people that pray like that. Maybe of the elite, elite monks that have separated themselves from life to dedicate themselves to worship, maybe some of them can compete with the pre-med student at some university, maybe. <coughs> person who's running a full, we're driving an Uber, maybe could compete with an Uber driver, maybe. But the prayer of praise is such a powerful gift from God, and it doesn't resemble, in its form and structure, I'm not going to go through it, because then now we're going to turn this into a whole tough series class, but not in its form and structure, but just our, um, the frequency in which we recite it, meaning the frequency meaning how often we recite it, and also the frequency, the vibration of the prayer itself, and that we're basically uh, tuned uh, to it, to that frequency, you know? Because of the rate at which we say it. Sometimes we're paying attention, sometimes our mind is drifting, sometimes this, sometimes that, but just that this happens all the time, everywhere, is like, there's no one even running a close second at all, at all, and praising God. So the 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 praise up, and I'm gonna say one more thing about Sultan Tafatia, and then I'm gonna answer the second question. Okay, I have a few more things about Sultan Tafatia. <laughs> okay. So so God introduces Himself as Allah, you know. It, and, and in the name and grammatically, it's, it's singular. It's only one thing. It's not like God and Goddess, Godfather, God. It's, it's singular and it's and it's and it's grammatical reality. There's only one way to say it. And once we, he introduced himself as uh, with names like Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, and then teaching us how to praise, and then that the praise is of different parts, you know? So there's uh, the praise of the servant for the creator. There's the praise that the creator praising himself. There's the praise of the, of the creation praising creation. And then there's the praise of the creator praising creation. So obviously when we say Alhamdulillah, we're praising God, that's the servant craving, uh, uh, praising God. Uh, where we can praise each other, wow, you're very skilled at this thing, or wow, um, you know, your house is beautiful. Um, that Allah praises his creation. He'll talk about the nobility of Ibrahim, or talk about the patience of 
of, of Yunus or of, uh, of Ayub, for example, uh, salam. And so, but all of these different types of praise, wherever you find in praise, all of the praise is Alhamdulillah. All the praise is for God because even if I'm praising the creation, so creation, praising creation, by extension, for example, if I'm at someone's house and they make some lamb and it's delicious, I say, wow, his lamb is delicious, the chef is gonna smile. Even if I didn't mention the chef, I'm praising the dish that the chef made. By the nature of it, I'm praising the chef, you know? Allah praising himself, the servant praising Allah, and Allah praising the servant, it's as if the chef is saying, listen, I've made some lamb, but this lamb? Serious, like this one? Wow, I really, so this is Allah talking about his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like I've made human beings, but this one? Ibrahim, I've made human, but this one? Maryam, I made women, this one? This is different. And Allah is praising his own creation. So all of the praises for Allah anyway. So. And this is whether a person is conscious of it or not. Because even if someone uh, doesn't know who I am and they were just walking by here, and they were like, man, I heard the most beautiful poetry coming out of this place. They've never heard my name, they've never seen my face. This will still make me smile, why? Because they praise me even though they don't know it. So even a person says, wow, look at this sunset. Wow, look at this dish. Oh wow, look at these sneakers. Oh wow, listen to this song and they're praising it. They're praising Allah. All of it is Alhamdulillah. All of it is Alhamdulillah. There's no praise except the praise for Allah. Whether a person knows it or not, uh, um, identifies with that or not. But when they do identify with it, mashallah, this elevates the praise to another level. And this is what Surah Tufat and Surah of Hamd. The Surah of Hamd, what it does, the Surah of Praise, what it does is it is a surrendering and an, and an admission that all praise is for Allah. And that's why it's not just Alhamdulillah, it's Alhamdulillah. All of the praise, the praise itself, in totality, all of it is for Allah. Whatever good I have, whatever good I've ever seen or witnessed, all of it is for Allah. And we continue, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, Humidim. Because when he, uh, if he introduced himself as the master of the day of judgment, perhaps that would strike a fear in our heart to, to reconcile after if that's he's the, the, the master of the day of judgment first. But he says Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Ar Rahman Ar Rahim until we say Malik Yomidin, it's enough to, to 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 make you mindful, but you know the master of the day of judgment is it's like if you're gonna go before a judge. Man, this judge is very nice, da 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 woo woo, but he's still the judge, so you're still gonna feel you come into the courtroom, you're still gonna feel the presence of his power, but you've, ahead of time, you've learned something about him to make you pleased to stand in front of him. But then all of that praise and all that description all comes to a point where then, and then after this I'll stop for it, comes to a point and then you ask for something. You don't ask for anything there, but then you ask for something. Remember Sheikh Ibrahim and Yassin and his tafsir said if there was something greater to ask Allah for at that point, then Allah would have put it there. But what do we ask for? <laughs> we ask for guidance. That. So all of this praise and all of this description is just how to enter into the king's court. You know? You enter into the, the king's court, like, you know, like if you watch Game of Thrones or something, but it's hard. I'm not even watching it. But there's a show about dragons and kings and queens and stuff. And when a king, when a king, when a person enters in a space, they'll give an introduction. This is so and so, second of his name, protector of the realms and the whatever the things are. You know what I mean? You come. This is how you, uh, you introduce into a noble's court. These are the things. But then you have a request, and the law is. What's amazing about it is that a law is making it obligatory for us for something. So it's not like you ask for something from someone who doesn't want to give you. It's like a king writing a letter to you, saying, come to me at this hour and ask me for this. Then how do you think the king's gonna refuse you? That means the king already wants to give it to you. 
He writes you a letter, Al-Quran, reveals it on the heart of his beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, casts it all to all the four corners of the world, saying, come to me at this time when the sun is in this position, when the night is, the, the, car, the sky is this color, when the shadow is this long, come to me and ask me for this. Then how do you think Allah is not going to give it to you? Alhamdulillah, obviously everyone is here, Allah guided us to this. Ihdina surat al mustaqim Then we ask Allah for guidance, and that is, Everything. So this is some of the reasons why al fatah is my favorite. Okay, and then the second question was what? Um, favorite, favorite thing I read and the favorite thing what? Favorite thing you wrote. That changes, uh, that changes quite a bit. Um, all right, this answer's not gonna be nearly as long. I'm compressing it right now. <laughs> Because there's some things that I write, like poetic techniques that I really like. My favorite poetic techniques, for example, are when you take a, the smallest element, like a letter, and you add it, and it changes the meaning of the thing, or you take it away and it dramatically changes the meaning of the thing. So, like for example, so I have a line where I say, um, we're just trying to make black history, but it's like you're trying to make blacks history. So just by adding an S to the word black, it not only changes the meaning, but almost like inverts the meaning. I love that, but that's just like a poetic, that's like, that's like the hip hop part of me. I was like, I mean, other people write poetry, but they can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that part of it when I say my favorite. Like, so the, st the things that I've written, people are like, yeah, there's no one else that can write that. Like, that's, like, <laughs> so, so that, but that's just like a, um, like a, like a technique, right? But then if I have technique and I have uh, meaning that is also uh, profound, then like it elevates it to another place. So for example, um, Actually, this is on my, on my new album. I have this song on my album called, um, what is the name of the song? It's the second song on the album. Okay, well, I'm the name of the song, right? Uh, I really can't remember the name of the song. Anyway, second song on the album, and the second verse. Um, I'm using like these homonyms, phonemes, and double entendres, and all of this stuff in this verse, what is it? Joy in the morning. Joy in the morning, yes. And uh, so for example, the verse says, I can never despair, because imagine Jonah with no well, or imagine Joseph with no well, Jesus Christ, no well. Uh, Jesus Christ, no well. Oh, y'all don't study the prophets? Oh well, I'll make sure my daughters know well. That the true believer takes no L, that the true believer takes no L. Even for my brothers that wake up in the AM with the AR, like Kendrick with no L, everyone knows that coke sell, no, it treats Reagan like a saint the way the snow fell. Everyone knows that coke sells, but forget that soul sell, whole sell. Y'all play gangster and go tell, but you're softer than with whole sell. Okay, we'll stop there. So, <laughs> So at the beginning, I say, uh, imagine Jonah with no well. So obviously we know the story of Jonah, he's swallowed by the well. And, but really try to imagine his narrative without the well. It's like, well, what would even the story be about? So when we're having these trials and tribulations and things that seem like cataclysmic, life-ending, life-destroying events, that that's just a part of a larger narrative. And depending on where you place yourself in that narrative, you can fall into total despair, or you can say, You can say Allah is planning something, and this is just a part of the story. So imagine Jonah with no well. Uh, imagine Joseph with no well. So Joseph was thrown into the well by his brothers, and if that didn't happen, if his brothers didn't betray him, and again, a horrible event that could break a person. If your brothers took you away from your father and threw you down a well, that's a, that's a horrible story, but we know this is, and this is actually a, the time where Allah boasts 
about his storytelling and the story of Yusuf in, in particular. Uh, imagine Joseph and Noel, uh, Jesus Christ Noel, so Noel, so I'm making a reference to the, what do you call those when they sing during Christmas, carol about the birth of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, y'all said the prophets are wild, make sure my daughter's no wild. So the no wild, and then no wild, and then no wild, and uh, I make sure my daughter's no wild, that the true believer takes no owl. The true believer takes no owl, no takes no loss. And so that is using like a clever poetic technique, but it's not just some um, lyrical gymnastics. I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm drawing meaning from these different prophetic moments and I'm, I'm making them sound the same because I'm, w w by way of the <coughs> composition of the poem, I'm saying they are the same. So Jonah in the well and Joseph in the well, they are the same. And even saying Jesus Christ in the well, saying this woman who's a virtuous woman has to show up in front of everyone with this baby, you know, and then has to explain to people about where this baby came from. She knows good and well, no one's going to believe her. And then even talking about even the trial itself of her birth and how she's described it as if she's, she's saying, I wish I was never, I never even was, I never existed. The pain of the, of the label was so great as she mentions and as Allah mentions in those verses. So again, this, and she's by herself and she's hungry and so on and so forth. So all of these events could seem like, you know, horrible events. So prophets know well, but the true believer takes no well. Even my brothers, so they're not taking it in a very modern context. My brothers who wake up in the AM, wake up in the morning with the AR, with a firearm, like Kendrick with Noel, but then that's just, uh, you know, if you spell Lamar, it's A-M-A-R with an L at the end, so wake up in the AM with the AR with Noel, but that's, that's one of those lines where I'm just like, yeah, y'all can't do this. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm real different, though. this is different. <laughs> this, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, you know, I toss that in there just in case anybody thinks it's a game, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so lines like that where I can, where I can, I'm really not just doing things that are clever, but I'm doing things that um, are clever, but the cleverness lends itself to a meaning that really could benefit a person. Like if they were to contemplate this and to live by it, <clears throat> they would, it would help them. Someone's going, someone's in the bottom of a well right now, in this room, there's someone in the bottom of a well. You know what I mean? So in this room, there's someone that's in the belly of a well. That's feeling like, I don't know how I'm gonna make it out of this. I don't understand how, how this happened, why this happened. I'm a good person, why am I here? Why do people betray me? Why are people abandoning me? Why, why, why? Of course, but to put it in its context, that we find great men and women like who I'm describing here, and they also had this affair, so it could genuinely help somebody. But, all that said, the greatest thing that I've written is um, this poem for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, called The Love of the Love of the Beloved. It's a, it's, a, it's a long poem. This is one of the few times, this is one of the exceptions to what I was saying about that I, that I, I intended to write the poem, but like I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna write this poem about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, um, but because I write poetry, and I'm Muslim, and I praise the Prophet Sallallahu and I send salutations on him, and I thought I was gonna sit down and write the poem, because I'm good at writing poems, turns out, right? So I sit down and write the poem, right? Like, wow, this is taking a week, it's a long time, it's why I said, wow, wow, six months writing this poem, this is crazy. Eight months, two years, seven years, 10 years. I've been writing this poem for 12 years, this poem. So I'm not gonna, um, recite all of that poem, because that's, that's like an hour of recite. Actually, on another occasion, when I complete the poem, inshallah, I'll come here and I'll do a, we'll do a recitation, inshallah, of the poem, when it's finished. But it's been like a major chunk of my whole adult life, uh, writing this poem. But I'll, I'll, recite, I'll recite a bit of it uh, here, inshallah. Uh, and then I'm gonna come for more questions. I know I took a lot of time on this question. And what time, what, what time is it? What time do we have to leave here? 8-12, right? What time do we start? We got like 39. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, so we're, we're, not, we're not in trouble. 30, 30, 40, okay. <clears throat> um, You are the sun at noon, 
You are the calf in the noon. You are the bat in the seen and the seen and unseen. You are a shoreless sea. You are a nightless day. You are the meaning of being with the angels we pray. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima uglika wal khatim lima sabaka nasru haq bil haq wal hayat ila asratak mustakim wa ala ala haqqa kajrihi wa mikdaan al-adim I gained your love and then I lost my mind. What a bargain. I love you impossibly. I trade my limbs to hold you. I trade my eyes to see you. I love you impossibly. I'm, I'm loving you more than I can. You are more deserving of love than I am, yet you are more loving than I am, as if you are loving a me who is more than I am. When I'm dying of thirst, you are water. And when I'm drowning to death, you are breath. It would seem that the rivers pouring from my eyes would extinguish the burning in my heart, or that the fire burning in my heart would dry up the rivers pouring from my eyes. What kind of fire makes water? What kind of river kindles flames? What kind of love makes sense? Through my senselessness and sleeplessness, I'm losing myself. But who needs a self when you have love. Everything is made of love and everything is making love. If the seed wants life, it is begging to be buried. If the wick wants light, it is begging to be burned. But if you want love, then you are begging for both. And then I said, well then burn me and bury me so the fire can't burn me when they bury me. I saw a twinkle in her eye, but she blinked. I realized the light was not from her eye, but from the lake. I turned to the lake and saw the light rippling over the surface, breaking into pieces, and I realized the light was not from the lake, but from the moon. And I turned to the moon and saw that it was waning, and I realized the light was not from the moon, but from the sun. And I turned to the sun and saw it setting and I turned back to her, even more enamored now, realizing that the light of the whole universe was in her eye. For you are the sun at noon, you are the calf in the noon, you are the bath in the seen, in the seen and unseen. You are a shoreless sea, you are a nightless day, you are the meaning of being with the angels we pray. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima uglika wal khatim lima sabaka nasru haq wal haq wal hayati ila asratika mustakim wa ala ali haqa kajrihi wa mikdal al-adim Me seeking to praise the beloved is to throw a handful of dust into the desert to increase its vastness. It is to spit into the sea to increase its volume. It is to light a match to support the sun. But may God be my witness that this poor poet attempted with his unremembered memoir recited from a dismembered memoir of a heartbroken, a mind bewildered, a heart more beaten than beating. Love did not descend upon his heart with a slow, long drip of cool honey. No, love set upon his heart like a flesh-hungry flame. No, love sat upon his heart like a pack of wild wolves. Do you not see the bellies fat from my flesh? Don't you see my blood in their teeth? Let their red grin be as evidence that it is not that I was always heartless. I used to be able to love he, she, they, and them, but now my heart has been consumed by a ravenous love that devours anything other than itself. I have fallen in love. I have not fallen for what is beautiful. I have not even fallen for beauty itself. I have fallen for the well from which beauty drinks. I have fallen into the well from which beauty drinks. And it was Tijani, Inyas, and Sise, like Joseph's brothers, who cast me into its bottom. But this well's darkness is brighter than the sun's light. So let the king of Egypt throw down his rope, I throw the rope back. 
and tell him he is trying to trade me his junk for my jewels. He's trying to trade me his dirt for my diamonds. Why be with the one who has the keys to the grains when I'm with the one who has the keys to the garden? Let this poem's parchment be as Joseph's garment. Put it beneath your nose to heal your blindness. Put it beneath my nose to heal my blindness. For I've wept myself blind seeking to find it. I'm running between hilltops searching for a sign of you. Running to and fro between Safa and Marwa, between sweetness and suffering, between beauty and breaking, between a longing that empties and a love that fills. Beloved, beloved, just give me some hope that one day I will drink from your palm, that I will smell your neck, my heart is already in your hands. Your breath is already in my mouth. And for these words, so celebrate me. But in truth, these words humiliate me. What is a poet? I'm a poet without the words. And what is a poet without the words except for a fire without, without the light? You are a sea without the shore, a day without the night. For these words, so celebrate me. But in truth, these words humiliate me. I've spilled water in my hand to describe the ocean. I've struck a match to describe the sun. My words can't match your worthy, and my love can't match your lovely. You are immense. I am a mess. But beloved, what can a poet bring his prophet? And what can a pauper bring his king? When you are already the sun at noon, you are the calf in the noon, you are the bat in the seen and the seen and unseen. You are a shoreless sea, you are a nightless day, you are the meaning of being with the angels we pray. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al Fatih Rima, Ugli Kawal Khat Rima, Sabaka Nasro Hakibil Hakibil Hat Ila. Surat al-Kamusakim wa ala ali haqqa katrihi wa midal al-adhim Alhamdulillah So, uh, so this poem I'll just mention something about the chorus uh, and then we'll move we'll, we'll on so in writing uh, this poem, the, the chorus, you are the sun at noon, you are the calf at the noon, you are the bad and the seen and the seen and unseen. Um, so you are the sun at noon, just meaning that the revelation um, left no shadow. Really what I mean is like the sun at its zenith. The revelation left nothing uh, ambiguous. It leaves no shadow, it leaves no place for darkness. It is complete, the light of guidance. The sun at noon, you are the calf in the noon. The calf in the noon, uh, meaning that the light of this Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being the, the first created light, that Allah, Al-Nur, the light created. And so that between this calf and the noon, in, in Allah's be and it is, was this light of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, that thereafter derived from that light came all of the rest of creation and uh, the sun at noon, you are the calf at noon, you are the bat and the seen and the seen and unseen. Bat and the seen uh, from a narration where someone comes to ask our mother Aisha, may Allah be well pleased with her, asking about the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace best be upon him and his family, and she asked, do you, uh, do you recite the Qur'an, do you read the Qur'an? He said, yes, of course. He said, he was like the Qur'an walking. And so, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so the bat of Bismillah al rahim meaning the beginning of the Qur'an, begins with the bat and, and ends with the seen, min al one nas. So you are the bat and the seen, and the seen and unseen, from what is revealed and what is obvious, and also what is uh, kept secret in the heart and the intimacy uh, and the divine intimacy. Um, but also part of this structure of this poem is that one of the signs of the maturation of a Muslim community in different parts of the world is that they develop praise poetry for the Prophet So many of the people have done this in Urdu and Wolof and obviously in, in Arabic and in other languages and so uh, and also, obviously, there are people who've written um, poems in English, but we haven't <coughs> had like an agreed upon poem. Like where all of us and our children, we all know this poem. 
uh, and this is from us, meaning us English-speaking Muslim people. And so I wanted to acknowledge the tradition of this praise poetry, but also say something specific about the English-speaking community. So uh, you are the sun at noon, so I use noon and noon. One noon is English, meaning the time of day, and then noon, obviously, the letter, half of the noon. And then the scene and the scene, um, one scene meaning being able to see something, and then other, the Arabic letter, as an acknowledgement of what came before, and also that this is a unique offering from all of us. So alhamdulillah, that's that, uh, that poem. But uh, any, yes? Wa alaikum salam. How do you do that? And I know your work very well. Um, I'm so I'm big fan of your work. How do you do that? Thank you. asking about this uh, poem, You Will Be Someone's Ancestor, which actually, even though I didn't remember the name of the song, that's the name of the actual album that I was referencing. It's called You Will Be Someone's Ancestor, Act Accordingly. And um, let me recite from it, actually, uh, now. And I don't uh, recite this poem often. Well, you know, actually, I do recite this poem relatively often over the last year or so, but uh, it changes every time I recite it. I add things, I take things away, but essentially, you will be someone's ancestor, act accordingly, counting our blessings, counting our losses, lost in memories of lost kin. And we will all like to live a long life, but the cost is that the longer we live, the more often we'll have to see our loved ones laid in their coffins. And I don't mention this to darken our spirit, rather to hearken us to a life worth living for our children, for our children's children, for those weapons that are inevitably formed against them, that your granddaughter can whisper through gritted teeth, I am the granddaughter of so and so, therefore I shall not fail. You will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly. When your son is on, surrounded by his enemies on the battlefield of life, and he raised his raised weapon over his raised head and exclaimed in his raised voice, I am the grandson of so-and-so. And that will be an inspiration for those with him and a threat for those who stand against him. You will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly and give fear no space, give it no portion. Fear is not fitting for a woman of God. It's not fitting for a man of God. And why be afraid? The angel of death has already mounted his swift steed and is traveling at speed for your throat and there is no turning him back. You will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly. And the Lord asks, for they think that we created them for nothing, for play, and that they will not be returned back to us? So don't return to the Most High unactualized, unrealized. That unspoken word stuck in your throat is for our world. That unsung song stuck on your tongue is for our hearts. <coughs> you will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly. By God, there are women lying still beneath the earth still more active than the activists. By God, there are men in your graves more alive than many of the living. <clears throat> they have done their task. They have completed the mission. What about you? What about you? You will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly. Will you let the dead outlive you? What a shame to let the dead outlive you. You will be someone's ancestor. Act accordingly. So, to answer your question, what I want to give everyone context for it, is that uh, 
sometimes, and different people are like this, but like black people, uh, different people express this in different ways, but um, sometimes we, we always, we love to hear about the glory of our ancestry. And it's so important for us because of the severe violence to our lineage that we experience being here in America. So talking about our ancestors and engaging them and having knowledge of them is, is, um, is a matter of life and death for us. And, uh, but sometimes I would have a sense that it was a very passive experience. It was like, this is what my ancestors did, this is what my ancestors did this, my ancestors did that. But it's like, yeah, but what, what have you done? You know what I mean? and putting themselves in the context of that con continuum. So it's not like the ancestors are a class of creatures or like some other, they were here like we're here and they did whatever they did and that's why we know this ancestor's name or that ancestor's name because they did something. And so not just to think, oh my ancestors are great, therefore I'm great, as it's just a sense of boosting one's self-esteem, that, that's good and that does help, but it's like my ancestors were great and did this, so therefore I'm gonna do whatever it is, you know? Um, you know, and so, you know, the, the, the sense of, you know, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams, and it's like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> if, if your ancestors were like in open war against the oppressors, they did picture you, you know, at 3.30 in the morning binging Stranger Things, you know what I mean, laying in the pile Use it dust or something. I don't know if that's what they were dreaming about. I'm saying, you know, for us to really take that seriously, not just as a default, as just, oh, you know, yeah, my, no, maybe your ancestors are like, yo, what? <laughs> what happened? And they're really confused. Jericho, look at this. You really want, yeah, look, this one, this one, this one she's doing now with her life. So, I, so to take that seriously, not just to feel entitled to that, but to be like, okay, really? Because sometimes I think we sell our ancestors short about how wild their imagination may be. So I say, the wildest dream of my ancestor? What, what really, what does that mean? What, who did they see? And not just uh, privileges that we have, because sometimes that's how we equate it. Like we think about privileges that we have, but like, like the content of character, like the strength, the determination, the courage, the will, you know? Do we have that at the extreme to the point that my ancestors would be like, yo, I never even imagined that from my lineage will produce this type of man. That's how I want to live. Where it's like, they're like, listen, we did X, Y, and Z, but this one from us? did that. Instead of saying, oh, they did this great thing, therefore I'm wonderful and I'm my, you know, it's just this kind of entitled position. So by inverting the relationship and saying, okay, you're gonna be an ancestor, it just causes us to pivot on that idea some, to really ask ourselves real questions. So with my great-great-grandson, first of all, will my great-great-grandson even know my name? Did I do something enough that it would, it, would, it would be fitting for him to say, like, you know who I am? You know who my grandfather is? You, you understand? What do I have to be and what do I have to do in order to make that? And, uh, and actually that, that came from the seer of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, when he enters into the battlefield and he exclaims his lineage, like, I'm the grandson of Abu Talib. Like, th that meant something. He said it out loud for some reason. So so what does he mean where he's announcing his lineage entering into the battlefield, you know? And if my grandchildren or great-grandchildren entered into the battlefield and they said my name, what, the, what would that mean to the ear, to their own ears? What would that mean to the ears of the people with him? And what would that mean to the ear of his enemy? They'd be like, oh, this is the grandson of Amir Salama. Oh, you know? Uh, of course, we don't want to be in a situation where, you know, they engage in a battle and it's like, you know, I'm the grandson of so and so. Like, oh, <laughs> it's going to be a cakewalk because <laughs> your grandfather was a coward and a rat. So, <laughs> we're good. 
you know what I mean? So I want to live in such a way where it's like, that's meaningful to him personally, or to her personally, but also it means something in the world. So that, it was just to encourage us to take that seriously and that we're in a continuum. It's not like the ancestors are here and we're here. It's like, this is a continuum, you know, going into the future and for us to think seriously about that. So that was the inspiration for that poem. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna take a few more questions and then we're gonna end, okay? This was the part where you're supposed to exclaim deep disappointment. <laughs> So I'm gonna take these couple and then we're gonna end. <laughs> First of all, I didn't even believe. The one person over there I believed, but the rest of you, at least, your heart wasn't in it. Okay, in the, in the back, yeah. Come do that, thank you. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh. Uh-huh, I think I'm here. I'm gonna repeat back to you what you're saying, but uh, I'm having trouble hearing you up here. Uh, so first, you were asking about my mentor, who and why, and then second, you were saying when I was reciting the poem for the Prophet Sallallahu it was reminding you of who? Sufism. Oh, Sufism, right, oh. And then the question about? And how do you find that you have a relationship with Ah. Got it, yes. Um, as far as um, a writing mentor, I feel kind of embarrassed to say this, but I don't have a, a, a writing mentor. Like, I, I didn't study under a person. I, I, I read uh, poets, contemporary poets, and poets from the past, but I didn't have a, um, a mentor, which is actually something I think about at some point I should do myself to make myself available to, for that type of relationship. Because all things, no matter what you're learning, it's, it's better to learn it from a, a living, breathing teacher, you know? And to have that relationship and it than learning from books. So I just looked up to different MCs, different poets, you know, Rumi and Hafez and uh, Fuddin Attar or, you know, or uh, people who wrote plays or songwriters, all kinds of people that composed that, that those influences that come together, but mentorship I, I never really had. Um, yes, you know, Sufism is in many ways central in my work. I didn't used to think about it in that way. I, I never thought about it like I want to infuse, I want to put Islam or put Sufi teachings in my poetry. It's more so I put them in my heart and then by by just the nature of my heart, they would, those ideas would come out in the poetry. Um, I, so they're not really like separate things. So it's not like one influence in the other, my poetry being influenced so much by that, but because my life is influenced by it, um, and just and studying the, the Sufi poets, it also gave me more room that, that I realized, actually like I was saying, I realized like, oh, I'm part of a lineage. Like the way that I write and the way that I think is not, because where I was growing up or the people that I was around or even the other poets I was around, they didn't write like how I wrote. And so they didn't write about God and spirituality in the way that I wrote it. So I was just, but I was just writing the way that I wrote. But then as I would read um, other poets from the Sufi traditions from the subcontinent, from Arabia, from West Africa, I was like, oh, I'm part of a, of a collective, a lineage, a continuum of poets. And so I felt then especially grateful that in the English language, for us to develop more and more poets, 
obviously I'm not the only one, and there's other you know, great poets writing in the English language, Muslim, Sufi poetry, and uh, for us to continue to grow this. And so then there will be people that are young today, and they grew up listening to me, or listening to, you know, Sakina Noor, or grew up listening to, or uh, reading, um, what's the, man, what's up with us, this is Divine Love? The book that, everybody has the book. Yes, you know, and grow up listening to her, someone that's five or six years old, or 10 or 12 years old, and this is part of what opens up their mind to the world, and so, you know, these, I think, are things that are valuable that we'll see the fruit of in the future, inshallah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes, that's what that's that's what I mean. So all the, all of those works had an impact uh, on me. I just didn't have a, a a living person that I was taking from. I didn't have that, but I had to learn these from these people from the, what they wrote, what they have written and um, that and left behind. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna get you over here because I feel like you've been having your hand up for a minute, right? Yeah. Okay. You know, on this note, uh, can you speak uh, more about um, the, the spiritual components of the creative process, and that do you have like a like a like a, a creative word or uh, a word or like you know you know tips like in the sense of like like mm -hmm. if you're like on a um, you know, mental block, uh, you know, you up the, like, you know, acts of, you know, good deeds and other, like, things not related to right. Yeah. Like, so he's asking about the spiritual, if there's any spiritual disciplines or particular afkar or dhikr or remembrances or, lit or litanies that I recite in relationship to my creative process outside of the actual things that are more obvious to the creative process or increasing a certain good deeds or something that helped me in the writing. Um, I can say, so yes, there, there are things like that. I don't really have a, um, like a, like a, um, like a routine. And probably just because I travel so much and it's a uh, routine is a challenge for me. But um, more than anything is uh, prayers of the Prophet so uh, A person indulges in sending salutations upon the Prophet then it, it softens the heart and it opens the heart. And the, the one that I love the most, as you heard in the poem, is this prayer called Salatul Fatihi. That's the one I was um, reciting in the context of my poem. Um, but using that, and there's different like number of them and different formulas, so to speak, and obviously all kind of different ways to do it. But as a general thing, hands down 1,000%, that is the, in my experience, that's the best spiritual tool for opening the heart and facilitating the creative process. Yeah. Yes. Why Why So at some point we've already had coach in school. Haiku, man, I did. Uh, I don't remember. I think uh, in my, I don't know, the thousands of poems that I've written, I think maybe I've written like two haikus before, and uh, I don't think any of them were awesome. <laughs> so I, I, I never lost it. They seem like they should be the easiest to remember, right? I'm reciting all these poems, all these words, and I can't remember the one with three lines, but yeah, sorry to, sorry to disappoint you. Yeah. yeah. Um, what a concern. I have two questions with comment for each. When you recited Ancestry, uh, did you have any chance to perform that in Papi No, um, no, because that poem was, that poem wasn't created yet, okay. when the last time I was there. Okay, yeah. well because that was the first time I met you there, uh, you the Papi Collective, and you still have the same passion Allah. in the way how you articulate poetry. I'm not a poetry person, I'm really the only one that I'm like, I got their attention. Don't do that. Mm. of like high, low, like all of that, and just like, mashallah, Thank you, alhamdulillah. Yeah, and my second question is, I think we kind of touched that a little bit, it has to do with, like, what was the most difficult uh, writing you've done, and what was that feeling like, and if 
negative? Like, how did you overcome that? She asked about what was the most difficult thing that I've written and how did I overcome it. In one way, the poem for the Prophet Sallallahu was the most difficult because I felt so incapacitated, particularly because I identify as a poet and so I think of myself as skilled as a poet. So my inability to be able to write about him was very disheartening. It was really, really difficult for me. Really what the poem is about is about not being able to write. It's more than that. It's about him saying, you know, to try to, you know, write, to praise my beloved is to throw a handful of dust into the desert to increase its vastness. It is to spit into the sea to increase its volume. It is to light a candle to support the sun. Meaning it just felt futile. It felt meaningless. Like, who cares what you have to say about him? He's so great. Like, what? It seemed um, stupid. And so it was very humbling and disheartening and uh, painful, actually. Uh, the the process, but um, I used the, what I was just advising the brother with, plenty of prayer on the Prophet Sallallahu and trying to remember my intention for doing it, and so then I just started to write about how I couldn't write, and those became, much of the po poetry of it became about that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, yes, yeah, see Well, I think it's not to Yeah, that's a great question. So she's asking, with so much art, you know, there's endless music and endless TV shows and endless films. Um, so much on cons uh, consuming art. She's asking for my thoughts on creating art, producing art, as a conscious, spiritual person and dealing in the esoteric and exoteric realities of that, yes. So that's a, that's a good question, and it was something that I began asking myself some years ago, and this is what caused me to get into writing for film and television as well, which we haven't talked much about tonight, but so I'm a writer and producer on the show, Rami, um, and uh, a Marvel TV show that'll be coming out next year, inshallah, and writing feature films and things like this, and um, Storytelling, for me, is the great power in the world. It is the primary power in the world. Um, and so I think it's very important for us, for when I say us, just meaning um, people that are making an assumption about you guys here, but people that want to bring good into the world, what if someone's like, oh, that's not talking about me. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. That, um, to, to get into storytelling. And even the word storytelling, it sounds um, silly, it's just fantasy, it's a waste of time, it's, you know, but stories inform everything. So when you think about the great powers of the world, economic power, military power, political power, all of those powers are underpinned by the power of storytelling. So if this political power, as you know, in these last weeks, all the campaigning is just all storytelling. Like, oh, this person is from this place and grew up on the farm, hardworking American people, whatever. And that's a story that they sit around the table, they decide what the story is, and they stick to the story and push the story of whatever it is, right? Both for and against each other, they create stories. Um, uh, military power, whatever war, you have to start with the story, you know? Pearl Harbor or 9 11 or. So it's like, okay, why 9-11? Why are we going to bomb Iraq? Like, what? Like, why? Right, we got to make a story. Yellow cake. Yellow cake, that's crazy. <laughs> they were wild with that one. But like, you know, you know, there's uh what, what, what was it? Um what was the chemical they were looking for? Um not plutonium, but uh uranium. uranium. You know, uranium rich all in it. Somehow we're gonna take the emotional momentum from 
and make it about war in Iraq. So this is, you know, storytelling, political and even economic power. The stock market is a, is a story. When, when a company is um, evaluated and, uh, you know, it's a story. All of it is a story. And even Allah, used, as we've mentioned tonight, used this story to reveal himself to his creation. So the story of Abraham, the story of Jonah, the story of Joseph's story. So even him using that as a tool because it contextualizes things. So if you talk about courage or patience, you can just say patience to describe what it is, but not until you put patience in a person and then put them in trials and tribulations can you really understand what patience is. So that's why we need Job, so that you can really understand what patience is other than just saying patience and then a dictionary definition that doesn't give meaning. So the whole world is made up of story. And so... It is not a small thing or a light thing or a peripheral thing, particularly in our age, because there's so much story all the time. The amount of, even the word uh, binge, we never used to use that in relationship to TV, you know? I'm not like that old, you know what I mean? But that's, uh, we never use that word in relationship to, we use it in relationship to drugs, and we use it in relationship to food. But never, because there wasn't enough TV to watch. There wasn't there was a, listen, I come from a time. <laughs> Put my hand on my hip. And TV used to turn off. Like you would watch TV, and then TV would stop. <laughs> like, there was a time where the TV would stop. There was like no more programming at whatever hour. It was like 2 in the morning. I don't know what it was. But the TV would turn off. But now, obviously, it never turns off. You know what I'm saying? And it's all just so much. You can spend the two hours that you would use to watch a movie, you would spend just scrolling, trying to find what you're going to watch. So it's a very, um, the level of programming, of television programming, but the, obviously it's programming us and the way we think and our worldview and what we like and dislike, what we find okay or not okay, what we find normal or abnormal. All of this is being informed heavily, heavily in storytelling. So I encourage for us to engage in a fair story and not treat it like it's a like a small peripheral thing. The world is being shaped and every, economically, militar, militaristically, even science and what, all of that still is relying on, on narrative. Um, and so for us to be skilled at how to consume narrative and not just for it to wash over us uh, blind, but to understand narrative enough that we understand how to consume it and also how to produce it and how it's used for us and against us. So I think that's very important. Yeah. Um, yes. Hi, Sam. Well, I like this Something that's neutral just for the sake of you to get a dollar or something that continues to fulfill you. Yeah. Well, the, the way that it's worked out conveniently for me is I love making money. So <laughs> it's just working style, just everything just went right in line with each other. <laughs> but, um, but more so, I think, to answer your question, that, that is serious. I wasn't joking about that. But the, the good thing is the type, of, the, the type of poetry that I write. And what I've what I've always written, I've I've like painted myself into the, into a corner. Like I've typecasted myself in a way, meaning not even what's expected of me. Like the way that I make money is okay. For example, so when I was brought on Rami last year, last season of Rami, um, the Mahershala Ali played a character in the in the film in the series in that season. And so the reason I was first brought on to Rami because they were going to have this black American Sufi imam, and so I was going to help them design and write this character. Why did they think that? It's not because I was written on other TV shows. They knew me for my poetry and giving talks like this. So 
the, the way that I've been making money is because of who I am. Not like I have to pretend to be something else. So much so that if I pretended to be something else, it would get in the way of my money. So I've, early on, I set myself like on a track. So I trapped myself in a way that my success is tied to what my porch has always been tied to, and there's no album or project or anything where I don't mention a lawless message or something, or I don't, or I'm not speaking about what's real and meaningful to me. So now that's totally in line with where I am at this level. So the main thing I would say is to be yourself early, so then you can be successful as yourself. But if you compromise early, then you're gonna have to compromise forever. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So because I locked in so hard body on what I do, I get paid for what I do. So I'm being invited into a writer's room on Hulu and making all kind of money. Why? Oh, because you're the black Muslim guy that likes Sufism. And that's, that's who I am. So then I'm doing, there's no, um, there's no conflict in the money making or what I'm doing to make the money. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. All, all the time. Every day, really. You know, so at some point, uh, once, you, once you're doing something that you love, I, I think I'm going to say a question better now. Once you do something that you love to do, but you do it professionally, the nature of the professional part of it is that you're going to have to do it when you don't feel like doing it. Basic difference between a hobby and a profession is that a hobby I can just do when I want or not. But once I'm make, doing it as a profession, that means I'm Basically, if I'm making a profession, that means I'm making an agreement. Someone is saying, I'm going to give you some money for you to do what you do in some parameter. In this time or place or in this way or whatever the case may be. And I do love doing it, but I can't decide I'm going to do this next month or next year. I have to do it now. So, you know, um, my brother here is a photographer. I'm sure whether he was getting paid for not paid or not, he's going to be taking pictures probably for the rest of his life, right? But then there's sometimes when he goes and shoots, you know what I'm saying, Jay Z somewhere, and they're like, "Yeah, we need these pictures by Saturday." You know what I mean? He may come home and not want to do it that night. He may want to break out the cheese hits, turn on the Stranger Things, <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? But he's like, "Yo, okay, I gotta sit down and do this," and that's what it is to be a professional. But I don't. I don't find it that it damages my relationship with poetry. In fact, it makes me um, honor it without, um, it makes me honor it even when I don't feel like it. You know what it's like, really? It's like the difference of having a wife or just having a girlfriend. It's like, okay, I'm in love with my wife, and I have to be in love with my wife even when I don't feel like being in love with my wife. So I just gotta, I gotta figure it out. We gotta, we're gonna have tough times, you know what I mean? And so we have to, I have to, I, I'm committing to when things feel great, and when there's trouble, we're gonna go through this together. That's what, really what I'm saying when I'm, we're married, you know what I mean? However, someone I'm just dating, it's like, this was awesome, now it's not so awesome anymore. And I liked it when it was awesome, but it's not, so maybe we shouldn't talk. Again. <laughs> but to honor my art, it's like, I've, 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 I've married her. And that's what the professionalism requires. It's like, I love you, and this is sometimes going to be easy, sometimes it's going to be hard. But I'm I'm committed to this, and we're going to do this for a lifetime. So that's it. Thank you. I'm going to stop there. Okay. I thank you so much. I'm not black. I appreciate you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, 
Donate to help support us at ICNYU.org. And most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.